Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so let's uh, briefly recap what we uh, learned yesterday. So yesterday was mostly about uh, quantizing the free field, both in uh, the sitter space and also in uh, mildly known the sitter space time when you have like these uh, small slow row parameters. And we discussed how to compute the power spectra of uh, scalar fluctuations and gravitational waves during inflation. And here is just a, a pictorial reminder of how the story works for free fields in the sitter space. And so if you plot the two-point function, so we, uh, you know, uh, well, you should probably forget about this early part. So early on, it looks like some uh, flat space uh, power spectrum there. So maybe I'm plotting the mode function. So this is a cartoon, okay? So there, it oscillates very fast. So the two-point function, I guess, is like more or less constant. And then uh, at k eta order one, what I was emphasizing yesterday, when the physical wavelength of your co-moving mode becomes comparable to the Hubble radius, then there is some amplification, some spontaneous particle production. And then outside of the horizon, depending on the mass of the particle, the amplitude will remain constant, which is uh, what we're interested in, because those are the probes that we can measure later on. But for massive particles, the amplitude will decay. So if there, even if there are other massive fields around during inflation, once they exit the horizon, they, their amplitude decays. So the only way to, to detect them is through the indirect imprints that they leave on the massless correlators, okay? So uh, if you care about names for the different representations, so representations, uh, the massless particle and representations, uh, they are light compared to the Hubble. Uh, scale have two different names, so the, the massless particle is said to be on the, in the discrete series. And, well, depending on how you define things, I would say that there is another, it's a, a little bit funny for a scalar particle, so there is a, another little island here, another isolated representation, which is a square root to h which is the case of conformally coupled scalars. So they, they both have similar properties. They have some sort of shift symmetry, both of them. So light particles, they are part of the so-called complementary series. They have this power law decay outside of the horizon, just a smooth tail effect, while uh, heavier particles are said to be in the principal series, and they have this oscillatory behaviors coming from this e to the imt that I was writing yesterday. So the idea is that these particles, they have a small Compton wavelength compared to the, uh, to the size of the Hubble radius. So when they are way outside of the horizon, they start traveling, you know, many horizon distances and they pick a phase as they, as they move around. So they start oscillating. And I, I did this uh, part here, the, the amplitude, a little bit smaller because also heavier particles are Boltzmann suppressed. So there is a, uh, there is a price to pay to produce heavier particles. It's uh, suppressed, okay? So there's, remember that there is this thermal interpretation of heavy particles in the sitter. So for particles in this uh, principal series, there is some Boltzmann e to the minus m over h suppression, okay? So this is just a quick reminder uh, of uh, what we talked about yesterday. And we started discussing the case of the higher point functions, and I focused most on the three-point function. And Ultimately, this is the goal. Uh, we would like to understand the shapes of three-point functions. And at weak coupling for slow row models, this is pretty much the only 
interesting diagram that one needs to compute. So if we understand this diagram for any mass and any spin, and contact diagrams are some sort of limits of this exchange diagram when the mass is very large, so then we classify all possible shapes of non-Gaussianity at three points, okay? So we would like to understand how to compute this uh, diagram to find the shape of the three-point function as a function of the um, different sides of the triangle. And as I'll show you, uh, as through this bootstrap method, you not only compute this three-point function, you also get the four-point function. As, a, as an intermediate step. So you compute both of these uh, interesting observables. And actually, all you need to compute is a single diagram. And uh, this, I guess, I, ha I haven't emphasized yesterday. So, and that's the power of you using the Desitter approximation. Okay. So this is the ultimate goal uh, over the next... Um, couple of lectures, so probably today and, uh, I don't know, whenever my next lecture is, uh, we're, we want to understand the features of these uh, diagrams and also learn how to compute them, okay? And so the roadmap will be, we uh, will first try to understand something slightly simpler. So we're interested in the case of massless particles on the outside exchanging a particle of generic mass and spin. But it turns out that if we understand the dynamics of a simpler diagram, everything else follows from kinematics, which is, uh, which is very nice. Okay, so if we understand this example here, and the example is you have four, four scalars, the scalars have all this conformally coupled mass, and they exchange a generic scalar particle, so the spin of this particle is zero. If we understand this example, we can get everything else by kinematics. So if we take this example and act on it with a bunch of like derivatives and multiply by factors of k, of the different momenta and so on, we can go from that example to these uh, two diagrams here. So that's uh, where the full power of the Sitter symmetry becomes important, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to go from here to here. Okay. So is that clear? So that's uh, the ultimate goal to understand this uh, this diagram here. Okay. So we're going to try to bootstrap this diagram, and then from here we can go to the more physically interesting example. Any questions? Before I start, okay. So, so we would like to compute that diagram, and uh, we want to exploit symmetries and exploit the singularity structure of the diagram. And again, we want to do things using this bootstrap. So we want to remain in the, in the spatial surface and somehow discover the emergence of a consistent time evolution by asking the right question there, okay? So the first thing we're going to discuss is the constraints that come purely from kinematics, okay? So what does kinematics tell us about the shape of the four-point function? And then later we're going to input some dynamics in figuring out the possible shapes of that four-point function. So first of all, kinematics of the four-point function. So the first thing is the following. So if you take a, if you take a quantum field in, in the sitter, Okay, so it depends on conformal time and uh, the spatial coordinates. And now, if we, we are interested in late time uh, behavior of this quantum field, so if we send eta to zero, then we're going to have some eta. What happens is if you try to solve the, 
the wave equation, you will see that the solution will behave like this. It will go like some uh, C plus eta to the delta plus mm. O plus of x plus C minus eta to the delta minus O minus of x. Or maybe I can even remove this here. So we are fixing initial, so as eta goes to minus infinity, remember that you want it to behave roughly like a e to the i k eta, right? Well, I guess that your integral decay. Kx, so, okay. Okay, so you, you uh, well, I hope that this doesn't cause more confusion. So let me, so we know what the initial, you have some initial time, you want them to behave like a, you know, single frequency mode functions at early times, but then if you go to late times, you will have generically a superposition of two solutions, okay, with different fall-offs, different powers of uh, fall-off, okay? And these, uh, these, demand, these uh, powers here, delta, are related to the mass of the scalar particle. So delta plus minus solve delta, delta minus 3 equals minus m squared over h squared, okay? Uh, and if I, if I write it in more detail, delta plus minus equals 3 halves plus or minus square roots, 9 quarters minus m squared over h squared. Okay. So in particular, notice that if uh, the mass is large, I'm going to get a 3 halves plus or minus i times something. So the plus or minus i times something is related to the oscillations, okay? And the three halves is related to the power law, fall off of the, of the correlation function, okay? <laughs> yeah, maybe here. Sorry, I just don't want to mess this up. Yeah, it's a sigma. It's not the two-point function. It's like sigma k of eta. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so these are these are the solutions, in, and in particular, we're interested. Of course, in general mass, but uh, for the case of m squared equals to 2h squared, then delta plus uh, equals 2, delta minus equals 1, and m squared equals 0, delta plus equals 3, delta minus equals 0. Okay. So, the fact that for massless particles you have a delta equal zero shouldn't surprise you, right? So if I look at a massless scalar, at late times there will be some piece that doesn't fall off with a conformal time. It's related to this. But there is also some part that decays very fast. And for the conformally coupled scalar, there is, a, uh, there is even the part that survives the longest still redshifts. Okay? But we are interested in the non-trivial spatial correlations. We can strip off, we can pull up front this overall power of conformal time, and there will still be some interesting non-trivial shape of the spatial correlation. Is that clear? So we're... <laughs> So 
So if you, if you look at, for example, uh, this conformally coupled scalar four-point function, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, you will go like eta to a certain power. Okay? So for example, if we're interested in the, in the delta minus parts, you would go like eta to the fourth. Okay? And times some interesting function that depends on the locations x1 to x4. Okay? So that's what we're looking for. Even though this four-point function actually decays, at very late times, that's what we're interested in, in the, inter in the non-trivial spatial correlations among the different points. Okay? Uh, the other thing is that the Sitter isometries, DS isometries, act on uh, O plus minus of X like the conformal group. acts on operators in a conformal field theory. Okay? So the De Sitter isometries can be traded by conformal symmetry acting on those uh, operators O plus of X and O minus of X. Okay? One last observation, delta plus, well, it's obvious from the equation, but delta plus plus delta minus, they always add up to three. So uh, one, when, uh, when operators add up to the dimension of space-time, well, in, the case, in our case, uh, the, this conformal field theory is some object that lives on this uh, spatial surface. So it's a three-dimensional surface. So here are spatial coordinates. So it's 3D. So delta plus, the operator O plus, is uh, said to be uh, the shadow. Of O minus. In particular, there is a nice formula that converts uh, correlation functions of the shadow into the correlation function of the original operator. Meaning, if you understand the correlation functions of this guy, you understand the correlation functions of this guy by kinematics. Okay? So we can trade which one of those uh, we are interested in. So we have now, we, can, we are switching from this problem here of having, you know, some consistent time evolution generating some non-trivial correlation function at four points to having some operators. So we stripped off some overall power. Uh, if I'm a little bit more careful, it would be eta to the four delta, for example, whatever the dimension of, this, of these uh, operators are. So I'm just trading for, for uh, some machinery that computes that function f. So it's related to just, you know, pinging here in this uh, spatial surface, picking four different points as, and studying the correlation function of these four points. And before we look at dynamics, let's try to understand what kinematics tells us about this uh, correlation function of four of four operators. Is that clear? So you trade the mass of a representation by these uh, dimensions here, by these numbers. Okay? So the mass of the representation in Hubble units can be traded by a pure number, dimensionless number, and this number is related to some scaling symmetry of, uh, of the correlators of these fields O plus and O minus. So this is the first observation. So let me emphasize one thing that people tend to ask me when I talk about this. So is this relying on DSCFT or string theory? And the answer is no. Okay, so this is a purely symmetry statement. 
So if you have any quantum field theory in the Sitter space, or for that matter, in anti-de Sitter space, you can just uh, take these uh, limits of the correlation functions in the bulk and trade them for a question about correlation functions in some specific slice. And the, the bulk symmetries act on this correlation function as the conformal group would in some uh, fictitious conformal field theory. Okay? But there is more to that when you take the leap to gauge string duality. Okay? There's crossing, there's uh, unitarity bounds, and so on. And we're not using any of that. We're just uh, writing a statement that is purely kinematical. Okay? So, okay, so, so this is the first step. So now we got rid of time, and we're only interested in the correlation functions of these uh, operators here in this uh, spatial slice. So let's write down. what the consequences of conformal symmetry are. So if you study the correlation functions in position space, this is an old problem that is well understood. Well, people know how to compute two, three, and four point functions. But we're, in cosmology, we're interested in these correlators in momentum space. So you could just say, I Fourier transform, what's the big deal? But you know, trust me, the Fourier transform is harder than figuring things out in momentum space from the beginning and uh, trying, to, trying to get yourself to the answer straight, straight up in momentum space instead of going to position space first. So a couple of things about conformal symmetry. So conformal symmetry... is kinematically very powerful. So the first thing is that two-point functions, two and three-point functions, are essentially fixed. So that's uh, pretty powerful. So I, I give you one example. So if I take, if I take a, a two-point function, O of x, O of y, And let's take the, the conformal dimensions to be delta 1, delta 2. Okay? And let's try to impose the symmetries one by one. Okay? So first of all, there are three translation symmetries. So this just tells me that it's going to be some function of, oops, of x minus y. So this is the consequence of translations. Now, the, the consequence of rotations is that actually it depends on the Euclidean distance between these two points. But up to here, I impose six symmetries, and uh, I still have a function, a function's worth of freedom. Now, if I impose some dilatation isometry, and that boils down to something of the form, if I rescale... I'm going to write things in momentum space in a second, so you don't need to worry too much about how this works in position space. You, you should have something like lambda to the minus delta 1 plus delta 2 times O of x, O of y. Then... If you look at this, then what is the solution? So then this function can't be any function. It must be a power law, like c divided by x minus y to the power delta 1 plus delta 2. So, so far, so good. It's nice. We get a power law. But we haven't used the special conformal transformations. And at two points, 
they already do something interesting, which is, um, which is even more constraining. So this is from translations plus rotations plus dilatations. Now special conformal transformations, and uh, I give that as an exercise. You should check that for special conformal transformations, O delta 1 of x, O delta 2 of y equals, let's put a C here, delta 1, delta 2, divided by And uh, C delta 1 delta 2 is essentially something like this. So it's only non-zero if the dimensions are the same. Okay. So you can't mix operators of different conformal dimensions, which uh, in the bulk is related to the fact that if you try to write a linear mixing term between two scalar fields, in the sitter, you can always diagonalize change basis to, uh, to a new field basis in which uh, the, the two fields don't cross talk and you just slightly shift their masses. Okay? So this is a consequence of special conformal symmetry, of full the sitter symmetry. Okay? So you're not very impressed, I guess. Okay, what's the big deal? But at three points, this is uh, extremely powerful. And and now we'll, and then we'll come to a little bit of a puzzle. So at three points, So I'm going to be quite heuristic here. So you have O delta 1 of x, O delta 2 of y, O delta 3 of z, of z. And you can play the same game. So translations will tell you you have a function of x minus y, y minus z, any function from translations, from rotations, uh, I guess something like this, and now, okay, the three sides of the triangle of points x, y, z. And now we come to dilatations. So how many solutions you think there are for, for something that will transform covariantly like this. So if you rescale all the coordinates, you get back the same solution up to a factor of lambda to a certain power. So if you, I'll let you think about it, but if you impose dilatations, there are infinitely many solutions. Now if you impose special conformal transformations, it's unique. Okay, so okay, it has teeth this uh, special conformal transformation. So this is a result by Polyakov, 1970, and uh, it was well the the actual conformal bootstrap uh, was uh, came a little bit later, and uh, was, uh, came from essentially two papers, one here in Italy from the group of Raul Gatto and uh, also a paper by Polyakov. But I think this result is, uh, is from earlier on, a few years, four years earlier. Okay. So it's quite powerful. No? You go from infinitely many solutions to a unique solution. Okay. So the solution is uh, something like some, some constants here that you know, uh, I'll just write it like this, and then x minus y to a certain power, alpha, y minus z to a certain power, beta. to a power gamma, okay? Where alpha, beta, and gamma, uh, let's see if I've written them. I always forget, yes. 
So alpha is delta 1 plus delta 2 plus delta 3 um, minus beta is delta 1 uh, minus plus delta 2 plus delta 3 and gamma is delta 1 minus delta 2 plus delta 3. Okay. So this is pretty cool. There's a unique three-point function. And in the bulk, what does it correspond to? It corresponds to the fact that no matter what you do, if you're in pure Decider space, uh, you can always reduce any three points computation to some equivalent theory where you write a phi cubed type of term and you recompute things in this phi cubed. So this result, because it's pinned down by kinematics, is actually non-perturbative. It's not three level, not one loop, not a, a million loops. It's like completely non-perturbative. So it's quite powerful. But now we come to a puzzle. So how come we have this plethora of three-point functions while I'm telling you that the three-point function is unique? So the reason is that uh, this is only true in the De Sitter approximation. So we need to relax the De Sitter approximation a little bit to get inflationary three-point functions. So what this means is that if we're interested in operators uh, of same conformal dimension, one, two, three. So let's say m squared equals two or zero, doesn't matter. This is the case that we care about for inflation then no matter what your theory is, at the end of the day, uh, the only thing you can write down is writing a phi cube term, okay? And just putting some coefficient up front. So you're gonna have some shape for this uh, three-point function coming from a phi cubed vertex. And no matter what your theory is, the only thing your theory is gonna do is gonna, so the three-point function phi of k1, phi of k2, phi of k3 is going to have some unique shape, f of k1, k, or I guess I call it b because it's bispectrum, b of k1, k2, k3, maybe a delta function. And the only thing your theory will do is change the coefficient up front, which is what we were calling fnl on thing, uh, yesterday, so speaking Portuguese. Uh, so, so that's the only thing that you have freedom of. So regardless of what your theory is, just by kinematics, it all boils down to reshuffling uh, the meaning of, uh, of the different parameters and putting a, a value of FNL or dialing the coupling of phi cubed. Okay? So it's too restrictive. You would tell us that the three-point function in, the, in inflation is unique. But inflation, here it's important that inflation is not pre exactly like the Sitter space. So we, once we relax a little bit the fact that we're not in pure the Sitter, we go from one shape to infinitely many shapes. It's a little bit like that uh, restriction that I showed up there, okay? The other reason we don't like this uh, shape very much is because this operator phi cubed it breaks shift symmetry. So if I, it's in, it's not invariant under phi to phi plus constant. Okay, and if you write uh, standard models of inflation, so it breaks shift symmetry. So if we if we write standard models of inflation, we would like recall that. Um, we had this field phi, and we had some potential, V of phi. And we want to have a relatively flat region somewhere where inflation can take place. Okay? So if you want this, uh, this part of the potential to be radiatively stable, you don't want to break shift symmetry. Okay? Because if you break shift symmetry through loops of this uh, scalar field, you might change drastically the shape of the potential. So this shape does appear in models of slow row inflation, but it's highly suppressed. Namely, the coefficient 
up front is very, very small. Okay? So there are more important effects that come about from considering that you're not quite in the sitter. So that's why we've been drawing this diagram where we take one of the legs to be very soft. So now we're relaxing, we're interpreting uh, a the sitter four-point function as some sort of uh, inflationary three-point function. And what is the intuition? Again, so if this extra field four is, uh, is very light, once it goes out of the horizon way before the three other hard modes, so then it's redshifting very slowly. And in, in essence, this, this extra field going out of the horizon, redshifting very slowly, is mimicking a time-dependent Hubble constant because it's dumping energy very slowly into the background, okay? So that's one way of thinking about uh, this diagram here. So again, so inflationary three-point functions have an infinite number of possibilities because we are calculating them from the Sitter four-point functions. Okay. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so we start with some theory of bulk fields, and let's uh, keep it general. You just have a quantum field theory in the sitter space, and there are all sorts of uh, fields around of various masses. Okay? So now we go to late times. We're interested in some correlation function at late times. And then uh, the first step was to show that you can trade the study of the correlation functions of quantum fields in the sitter space for correlation functions of these operators defined in this, uh, in this uh, boundary here. Now, for scalar fields, the only piece of information you need is the mass of the particle. And I'm saying you can trade the mass for these uh, conformal dimensions delta, okay? The, the delta, they, the, they solve, uh, you know, delta, delta minus three equals m squared so now you erased all the previous information about masses, okay? And now we're interested in computing these uh, correlation functions. But before we compute them, we put any dynamics in, we would like to understand how powerful is kinematics. And then I showed you here somewhat quickly that the kinematics is so powerful that it essentially it fixes the two and the three point function up to a coefficient, okay? So the two-point function is fixed up to a coefficient. This coefficient is related to the facts. Remember yesterday that the number that appears in front of the action is, uh, is, depends on, on the observable that you're interested in, right? So you have the action, and the action looks like d phi squared minus m squared phi squared. But then you have some number f that you can put up front. That's how we dialed the relative ratio between tensor modes, and scalar degrees of freedom. So this number essentially boils down to this number here. Okay? Now we go to three points. And at three points, it's so constraining that the answer is essentially unique. So there's a unique shape. So then you write the simplest possible operator, which is like a phi cubed operator. And then this c here, this uh, coefficient up front, is just related to, that, to some coupling strength of this uh, cubic vertex, okay? And because these are kinematical, they're actually uh, completely non-perturbative. It, it doesn't matter. It's not a three-level statement. Okay. So I hope, does that answer your, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Yes.
That's right. So we don't care about spike Yeah. We're going to mostly focus on, on shift symmetric uh, interactions. We can compute it. It's not very complicated. But uh, we don't expect them to be relevant uh, for inflation. OK. So this was a little bit heuristic. Now let me write down in momentum space what are the constraints of conformal symmetry. So keep in mind that what we are looking, we are, we are gunning for this example here. 1, 2, 3, 4, m squared equals 2h squared, meaning delta equals 1 or 2. And we have an exchange of a particle of mass m. Okay. By the way, I, I showed here at 2 and 3 points, things are completely fixed. But now at 4 points, you have infinite freedom. It's not like you can write anything you want. But now it's not so constraining, okay? which is related to the fact that at four points, you can write contact diagrams, you can write exchange diagrams, loop diagrams, and so on, and the shapes will change. Yes? That's right. That's right. And so that's uh, that. So, but it's not wildly far away from the sitter. So, what we're gonna we're gonna interpret the fact that there is a family of inflationary three-point functions as coming from this diagram. So, I do this computation in the sitter where the fourth leg is hard. And then I take the soft limits on the fourth leg, and the fourth leg being soft provides the background that is mimicking some small time dependence on the Hubble parameter. So we get inflationary three-point functions from the Sitter four-point functions. And the Sitter four-point function now has a lot of freedom, unlike the Sitter three-point function. Okay. So that's, that's how this uh, freedom of having inflationary three-point functions, more than one, comes about. Okay. It's coming from the Sitter the four-point function. You can, yeah. Now, now when you're at four points, you can do, and recall that the example I gave yesterday of equilateral non-Gaussianity is uh, is a con hard context diagram, but uh, not phi to the four because it has the same problem as that. It breaks shift symmetry, but if you take d phi to the fourth, then uh, even okay. So even for contact, I'm jumping slightly ahead of myself, but. Even for context diagrams, there are already infinitely many of them, right? Because you can have d phi to the fourth. You can have, uh, uh, I don't know, like, you can have d mu. I'm sure this is probably zero if you integrate by parts. But OK, I'm going to go on a limb, like something like this, and so on. So you can write infinitely many contact terms and then take a soft limit. So you're going to get all sorts of, uh, even at context level, you have already an infinite family. OK? Any more questions? OK. So now let's write the constraints of conformal symmetry on the four-point function. And I'm going to write them correctly. OK. So in momentum space, so rot uh, again, translations imply that the correlation function, let's focus on four points, phi 1, phi 4, is going to have a delta function. Okay, delta function of three momentum of k1 plus, plus k4 times something. But this something can be whatever. Okay. In, now if you impose rotations, the four-point function is going to have a delta function. But now this function here is going to depend only on dot products, ki 
dot kj. Okay? So still not very constraining. Now, dilatations give you something interesting. So dilatations will give you the following. So now I'm being more careful. So zero equals sum n equals one to four, because we're at four points. Delta n minus three minus k kn d d k n. Phi one, phi four. Ah, small notation. So the delta function is just uh, is just an annoyance to study conformal symmetry. So I'm gonna look at the stripped uh, four point correlator when I remove the delta function, and then I'll I'll call it phi one, phi four. It's standard notation with a prime, okay? So it's just uh, so that we forget about, it should always be in the back of your mind that there's a delta function of momentum conservation, but we're, we're interested in the, in the coefficient up front, okay? In particular, yeah, nothing, forget about in particular. So, so this, is the, this is the constraints coming from dilatations. So here n are the momenta of every particle, and I'm uh, taking over every component of every momentum k d d k. So it's a scale transform. It's not very surprising, right? This is a scale transformation k d d k, and uh, there's a delta minus three. Uh, yeah, the minus three I can tell you if you ask me later. If you don't care, believe me, it's delta minus three that appears here. Okay. It's just, it's just coming from the doing the Fourier transform of the formulas that we wrote. So we wrote this formula here for the scaling transformation. And if you do the Fourier transform carefully, then uh, anyway, you pick up this minus 3. I know it's not being very clear, but uh, it's not very complicated. So. Now, for special conformal transformations, I was sweeping it under the rug because they're complicated. Remember that there were some complicated quadratic transformations. And, and these are the stars of the story. They make uh, things very constraining. So, of course, the price you pay is that they don't look simple. So here is how they're going to look like. So you have 0 equals sum n equals 1 to 4. So you, you get something that looks like a... And uh, there, are, there are three of them, so there's going to be a free index here in this formula. So it looks like, it looks a bit like a, a, it is a scale transformation, but it's space dependent scale transformation. Minus KNJ D2 DKNJ DKNI. Plus K and I over two. Uh, pa, 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 sorry. K and J over two. D two D K and J D K and I. Acting on five one five four. Okay. So it's a second order differential operator. It has a free index because there are three different uh, special conformal transformations. And uh, you have to solve this differential equation. So this is all kinematics, okay? This is nothing to do with dynamics. It's equivalent. It's a little bit annoying because uh, uh, in, in other contexts, it's so trivial that we often forget how powerful it is. So I give you an example. When we study 2 to 2 scattering amplitudes in flat space, Naively, the, the kinematical space, not naively, in practice, the kinematical space has 12 variables, right? You have, hey, <laughs> so the, the kinematical space has 12 variables. You have to specify the spatial momenta of every particle, of every one of the four particles, 
Okay? So you have 12 pieces of data, but somehow Lorentz symmetry is so powerful that it collapses down to two variables. You have the Mandel's terms, right? S and T. So in a sense, we're trying to find the analogs of Mandel's terms for the cosmological correlator. Okay? Yes? Pa, 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 pa. Did I mess up the indices? Yes, thank you. I think it's like this. So maybe it's better now. Right? Yeah. Yeah, the indices are screwed up. I'll check. Uh, well, okay. These are the only two combinations. The question is whether this, uh, yeah, if this has the minus and this does, this has the plus one half. But I'll check. No. All right, we're not going to solve them explicitly. I'll tell you the answer, so you don't need to worry uh, too much about it. All right, so now uh, let's. Ah, I need to say one more thing, which is related to these uh, shadow operators. So naively, we're interested, so if you take phi 1 to phi 4, naively, we would be interested in, in, the, in the part of the correlator that decays the slowest, right? So for the case of conformally coupled, it would be you pay a price of eta for every one of them. But if you do that, the resulting four-point function has some annoying factors of k in the denominator. So in order to avoid that, there is a nice formula that relates uh, the shadow operators to the original operators. So we're going to think in terms of the shadow. Okay. So let me just write the formula here for you. I <laughs> uh, don't want to mess it up. Okay. So if you take the shadow operators, phi tilde, with, uh, with uh, dimension delta minus, they are related to phi 1 to phi 4 with dimension delta plus by a factor k1 to k4 to the, mm, <laughs> God damn it, to this is written in a terrible way, sorry. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. Delta plus minus 3. OK. So the only thing is that the interesting dynamical information in the four point function is in both of these, uh, in the growing mode and in the decaying modes. And the actual shape of the correlation function is. Uh, they are related to each other just by these annoying factors of k here, OK? So I don't want to carry these annoying denominators around. And so I'm going to focus on the decaying mode instead of the growing mode. So we're interested in phi 1, phi 4 with delta equals to 2, OK? So this, again, this is not a big deal. It's just so that we're lazy and we drop some factors of k in the denominator. Okay? And now the fact that we have delta equals to 2 will be useful for something. So now let's uh, look at the kinematics. 1, 2, 3, 4. And we have the exchange of momentum that I'm going to call k1 plus k2. So let's call it s in analogy with s channel. but this is actually a momentum scale and not a momentum square, like in uh, flat space scattering amplitudes. So if you look at this four-point function, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4, there's going to be a delta function, so I'm stripping that off. Then by dilatation symmetry, there's going to be an overall power of one given momentum. Because we're focusing on the S channel, I'm going to pull off a power of the momentum S itself. Okay? So, and it turns out that the overall power is, 
momentum to the minus 1. So you get a 1 over s times some function of ratios of momenta. Okay? And here, in principle, you have various ratios of momenta, and you have to impose these special conformal transformations. You have three of them, and now I'm telling you, so there must be something good about working with uh, these, uh, these uh, conformally coupled scalars. Otherwise, why would we bother studying this example first? So this is one good reason. You can diagonalize two of them immediately by writing a function of the two variables that I'm defining to be u and v. And these variables, s divided by k1 plus k2, v is s over k3 plus k4. Okay. So again, if I don't have an arrow uh, on top of a momentum, it's just the absolute value of this momentum. So s is the absolute value of the sum of these two momenta. Well, this is the sum of the absolute values of the momenta, just so you don't think I'm writing one and trying to trick you. Okay? So uh, this is an actual variable that is non-trivial, likewise for v. So this diagonalizes two of the three special conformal transformations. But okay, life does get complicated eventually. We have one more special conformal. So now we're down from 10 isometries to just one. So we impose the translations, rotations, dilatations, give me this 1 over s factor. And now two special conformal, but the last special conformal will impose some non-trivial uh, constraints on this function f. And the non-trivial constraint is that it must satisfy a partial differential equation. where this delta operator is some hypergeometric. OK, so that's a little bit annoying. We have to find solutions of this partial differential equation in two variables. But so far, this has all been about kinematics. And now we must input some dynamics. When we input dynamics, we're going to see that it's not so bad to classify possible solutions of this uh, differential equation, OK? So here we got down to the analog of trying to find what are the Mandel stems of this, uh, this four-point process, OK? So we're almost there. So kinematics will give us that any solution of this equation is an allowed diagram. But now we have to figure out which solutions will tell us interesting, simple stories of what was going on here in the bulk. So for that, we need dynamics, OK? So I think maybe I give a five minutes break, because I think it's a good time before we do dynamics, OK? So OK. Uh, <laughs> ah, OK. So sorry, Vidyo. Now you don't know what happened. So uh, OK, so if you look here, um, so this has a singularity as uh, u plus v goes to 0 or as k total goes to 0. Okay? So unique singular point. Or OK, let's, uh, so there is a pole-like singularity. Let's zoom in the pole. So the four-point function, is going to have you know, this 1 over k total singularity. And the residue at the singularity is lambda. But lambda is the flat space scattering amplitude. So that looks interesting. Well, you're probably not very impressed with this example, but there is some singularity. And the residue at the singularity is related to the flat space scattering amplitude. But actually, as I'll show you now, 
this is not an accident. Well, this example is trivial, but actually it's always true. Okay? So every cosmological correlator is going to have uh, singularity whenever sum of the energies goes to zero. And when the sum of the energy goes to zero, what you get is a flat space scattering amplitude. Okay? So let me give you some intuition for, for why that's happening. So if you, if you look at this, um, at this uh, equation here, so the, the integral, this integral here, is converging as I go uh, from minus infinity to zero. It's converging at minus infinity because of some type of I epsilon prescription. So this piece here is oscillating very fast, but you're keeping the total energy fixed. Okay, so the so the integral converges and it gives you something uh, finite. But now, if you were to send the total energy to zero, you see you're precisely killing off the exponential that damps the, the contribution from very early times. Okay? So the integral becomes singular as you send the total energy to zero. Moreover, now when you look at the residue, most of the contribution has to be coming from very early times. But recall that at very early times we are imposing these quantization conditions such that every mode has such short wavelength that they don't even know they're in curved space. Okay? So you should get some sort of answer that makes sense in flat space because each mode has very short wavelength. They don't even feel the effects of curvature yet. So this is the manifestation of this effect. Okay? So we have some, some singularity. When you zoom into the singularity, you're essentially sending all the modes to very early times. They don't know they're in curved space, and the final result is a flat space scattering amplitude. Okay? Notice that in order to do that, you have to get out of the, of the physical sheet. And so k's are, let's recall, every k is an absolute value of a momentum k, which uh, in more detail is square root of k squared. So there's some square root branch cuts for every one of the, if you think of this as an analytic function of the three momenta, there are square root branch cuts at every one of these guys here. So I go to the second sheet, I can flip now the sign of one of these fellas here, and now I can zoom into k total equals zero. And when I do that, the residue is, will be related to flat space scattering amplitude, okay? So what it boils down to is I'm dragging this vertex all the way to minus infinity, okay? So if it is a context interaction that I'm classifying, it better have only singularities when I send k total to zero. It can't have singularities anywhere else because if it had the singularities somewhere else, then it would correspond to some process here in the bulk in which when I zoom onto said singularity, I'm doing something special. I'm sending something to minus infinity. But there's only one point where stuff happens. The non-trivial interaction, if it's contact-like, it only happens at a single point. Of course, you're integrating it over, but when I send k total to zero, I'm essentially dragging this unique interaction vertex all the way to minus infinity. So it better be the only singularity in the correlator. Is that clear? So you can't have singularities elsewhere. For the case of exchange diagrams, there will be more singularities because now there are more, there's more than one special moment in space-time where stuff happens. Okay? So that's the distinction between contact and exchange diagrams. That, is that clear? Okay. And now, that said, now comes a pleasant surprise. We can bootstrap all context diagrams without doing any more calculations. So look here. So if I know the first context diagram, everything else comes about by multiplying things by Mandel's thumbs, okay? Multiplying by S. Now, let's see if there's something analogous. So we would like 
So context diagrams, we, we want two requirements. One, that it solves delta u equals delta v. And two, only singular s u plus v goes to 0. Okay? Those are the two requirements. Now notice the, something interesting. Take the first uh, solution, which is uh, uv divided by u plus v. uv divided by u plus v. Let me change notation and call it c naught. Now take delta u acting on c naught. Okay? If you look at this, uh, let's call it c1. Delta u c1 equals delta u delta u c naught, but c naught solves the equation, the kinematical constraint, so equals delta u delta v c naught. Delta u and delta v commute equals delta v delta u c naught equals okay, delta v c1. Okay? So c1 solves the kinematical constraint. And this is a second order operator. It acts with two derivatives and so on. So what is it going to do to, to this uh, expression that is a rational function? It's just going to give you a new rational function with perhaps a denominator of higher order. Okay? So C1 is going to be blah, blah, blah. And I let you figure out what it is divided by u plus v cubed because there will be two derivatives acting on C0. Is that clear? And it's automatically a solution of the kinematical constraints. And again, it's only singular as I send u plus v to 0. So it's a context term. We classify the new context term. So how do you classify the next one? What do you do? Multiply again. If you multiply C, if you apply delta u, on C1, you get something with u plus v to the fifth. Delta u, on, you get the idea, right? So now we classified all context terms of this uh, S channel type. Okay? So any context term, and this any has some uh, caveats, but uh, OK, you ask me later. Any context term is given by delta u to the n on c0. Okay. Let's look at the first context term, c1. And uh, now we, send, we, we go back to the full four-point function. So it's going to have, you know, k1 plus k2 plus k3 plus k4 cubed times some numerator that depends on k1 all the way to k4 and maybe on s. Okay. Now let's zoom into, now here's something a little bit more non-trivial will happen. Now let's zoom into the total energy pole. Now as you send the k1 plus, plus k4 to 0, then you get 1 over, let me call the, this thing here e, 1 over e cubed. And the numerator, lo and behold, will be, I always get this wrong, so bear with me. So it's going to be minus k1 plus k2 squared plus s squared. Where s, recall that s is k1 plus k2. Okay? So, what would you like to call this thing here? Re now, the, to think about this as an energy is a very good idea. Because if you take k and take its absolute value, k, it looks like a null momentum, right? So it makes sense to think of this as some null momentum p mu. And now, what is this? It's p1 dot p2 which is the flat space Mandelstam for massless particles, OK? So now we recovered 
this term starting from this term by multiplying by s in some sense. Okay. So what do you think will happen at next order? I'll have c2, it will have some k total to the fifth power. Now you zoom into the pole, you're going to get s squared and s cubed and so on. So you not only you get all the contact terms, you, you recover some, not just a qualitative, but really you recover this result in flat space of a classification of S channel like contact terms. Okay? So that's pretty cool, no? Because it, it means that these cosmological correlators in their analytic structure, they contain flat space scattering amplitudes. So it really means that uh, this is an object that knows about cosmology, but also knows, in some sense, about flat space scattering. So we're going to keep leveraging that to understand how things work for exchange diagrams. Any questions? So let's step back and look now at the exchange. So now we understood contact interactions, and it's a good stepping stone to, ex to understand exchange diagrams. Okay. So you have your, your, your imaginary collider experiment. You're cranking up the Mandelstam S. And then you start, feeding, you start feeding the data with some Taylor series and so on. And at some point, if you're lucky, you discover a new state. So then you can't fit the data with uh, Taylor expansion anymore. So you discover some new resonance. Okay. So if we work at weak coupling, tree level, and so on, how do we incorporate this new resonance into our scattering amplitude? So the location of the resonance is related to a new particle, like m squared. And so what happens? So you know, based on locality, the fact that propagators go like 1 over p squared, the only thing you can have are simple poles in the scattering amplitude, because you're working at tree level. Okay? So, and now you see some resonance at a specific value of the Mandelstam. So pretty much the only thing you can write down is S minus M squared, okay? related to the appearance of this resonance. But now when you're sitting on the resonance, what's happening? You're, you're giving just enough energy to create, to, to let this new state of mass M travel an arbitrarily long distance. So, so when you do that, so now your new states can travel very, very far. So what does it mean? It means that when you're sitting on the pole, the amplitude better factorize, okay? Because you're giving arbitrarily long distance for this new state to propagate, okay? So the residue at the pole must be related to three-point scattering amplitude. So you should, you should get three points scattering amplitude on the left times three points scattering amplitude on the right. Okay? Because we are studying scalar particles so far, this scattering amplitude actually is just a constant. There is nothing else you can write down. It's pretty much analogous to the fact that the CFT three-point function is unique up to a constant. Remember that the only thing I could write down in the bulk was a phi cubed term. So here, again, for three-point scattering of scalar particles, the only thing I can write down is a constant. There are no Mandelstams for three particles. Yeah. Let's see. Is, do you want me to show you that? So I have P1 plus P2 plus P3 adding up to zero. And every pi squared equals m squared, right? So if you try to build, build a Mandelstam, like say p1.p2, then what happens? Let's, uh, 
put P3 on this side and square the equation, I get P1 squared plus 2P1 dot P2 plus P2 squared equals P3 squared. So each one of these three terms is a constant, therefore P1 dot P2 is also a constant related to the mass of the particles. Okay? So there is no function of the momenta that you can write down here. So the only thing you have is a constant. So if it factorizes on the left and on the right, and the external particles are identical, because of locality, you better have a G here and a G here. So you get a G squared. And that's it. Anything else that you might want to write down? What about other vertices? What about this? What about that? Anything else that you want to write down, you can always reduce to rewriting this fraction plus a series of contact terms. Okay? So that's the unique exchange solution as long as we're talking about scalar particles everywhere. So this is the exchange scattering amplitude. And in analogy with this story of delta u is like multiplying by s, I'm going to justify uh, some equation for how this works in the case of cosmology. But notice that there is a, there is a nice way of rewriting this equation, which uh, for scattering amplitudes is trivial. But we can write the equation like this, s minus m squared times m exchange equals g squared. But g squared is like a contact term. Okay? So it means that there is some operator, some Klein-Gordon-like operator, s minus m squared, that acts on this uh, 2 to 2 scattering amplitude, m, that will give me some contact interaction, okay? This is a pictorial way of writing the equation above. So this is just to give you some intuition for uh, the exchange equation for the four-point function. So what, what can we expect for the four-point function? of the exchange type. So now I have one, two, three, four, and I'm exchanging just this. A particle of mass m, OK? And I'm talking about dimensionless things all the time, these u and v variables. So OK, the only the obvious thing to do is to think of the mass of this particle in Hubble units. Okay. So now, given that I wrote an equation like this, and s is like multiplying by m, you, I don't think you will be shocked if I say that this exchange diagram should solve an equation that looks like this, delta u plus, and this is being a little bit impression, impressionistic, but it's um, almost correct. Exchange uv equals maybe with some g squared here, uv divided by u plus v. Okay? And because it must solve delta u equals delta v, the same equation must be true So this is precisely analogous to an equation like this. And if you do a brute force computation, you, you actually get something that looks almost like this equation here. I'm going to show you the details next time. But before we wrap up, I, I want you to stare at this equation and notice the following. So now delta u, again, is like u squared, 1 minus u squared. Let's think about the singularity structure. Because if we are saying that this is an exchange diagram, now there can be 
different things, different limits or different singularities that control different things happening here in the bulk. Okay? So recall from the theory of uh, differential equations that if you have some differential equation, it can only have singularities if uh, the leading part of the differential operator goes to zero. Okay? So the singular points are u equals zero and plus or minus one. And the same thing for v, zero plus or minus one. Okay? And also when because of the source, when u plus v goes to zero. Okay? So the u plus v goes to zero limits we already discussed is when we send everything to very early times. Okay? So the whole process is happening at very short distances, you're probing flat space scattering. But now, uh, if you look at each one of the singularities in U and V, there are different kinematical regimes. Okay? When U goes to, uh, I always get this wrong. When U goes to, uh, I'm going to get this wrong. When U goes to plus one, right. When u goes to plus 1, what's happening? When u goes to plus 1, so s equals k1 plus k2, which means that if you take the four momenta now, you have k1 and k2, k3 and k4. Okay. So this is called the folded limit. You're just aligning two of the momenta. So in principle, the equation can, the solution can be singular in this folded limit. But there is nothing special going on in space-time when you align the momenta. Okay? So the absence of singularity in the folded limits will be a, a requirement on fixing the solution of, the, of this uh, differential equation. So we don't want anything special happening in the folded limits. So the folded limits shouldn't be singular. Actually, it would be great if the folded similar, if, if the folded limits were singular, because the folded limit is accessible in the physical sheets. So you'd go up in the sky, you'd try to correlate four momenta, and if two mo it's really the stars are aligned. If two momenta are aligned, you'd see the signal spike. And we would be very happy and understand all sorts of beautiful things, but okay, that's not how nature works. So we don't want uh, this to be singular. So that's one requirement. Likewise for v equals plus one. Now u equals minus one. u equals to minus one is when s plus k1 plus k2 go to zero. So again, I need to go out of the physical sheet. I analytically continue one of the momenta, but now I send the sum of these three energies to zero. But now notice something interesting. S plus K1 plus K2 to zero is the sum of the energies entering this vertex to zero. One, two, and S. Okay, so when you send S plus K1 plus K2 to zero, it must be related to just taking this vertex, keeping that one put, and sending it to minus infinity. And this is what the singularity controls. Okay? So this it's related, it's a left vertex goes to the past. And likewise for V equals minus one. And for you going to zero, uh, maybe I'll I'll let you think about it because this is where some interesting magic happens. Okay, so u equals zero magic. Okay. So this is a very interesting limit. Why? Because when u goes to zero, you're sending s to zero. So you're making this this momentum here becoming very soft. And remember that when we talked about this uh, idea of using cosmology as a particle collider. 
We want to have mediators around in these squeeze limits of the three-point function, because otherwise you can't mediate. You can't have. You have like. You can't have non-trivial interactions. So if you have non-trivial interactions in these squeeze limits, they must be mediated by a mode that travels a very long distance. So this s going to zero limit is controlling precisely this regime in which we want to to see the imprints of the mediator particle. Okay? So when S goes to zero, the mediator particle travels a very long distance. The mediator particle travels many Hubble radii. Okay? So even though the naively the the cosmological correlators should switch off because you have a, a mediator particle, there will be some interesting physics controlled by the features of the mediator particle. Okay? So that's the easiest channel to do spectroscopy around S going to zero. Okay? So that's it. And as U plus V goes to zero is the flat space limit. of the full correlator. So this equation must be right because it, con it, it, it controls precisely the interesting regimes of this. Um, so this correlator, interesting stuff needs to happen when this particle travels a long distance or when you drag each one of the vertices to minus infinity at a time or when you drag both of them at once. So it has all the singularities to precisely do this job. Okay? So next time we're going to discuss how to solve the equation, what are all the boundary conditions that need to be satisfied to completely fix it, and I'll show you how the solution looks like. Okay? So I'll stop here. Thanks.